A majority of how we act in life is subconscious. And gosh, I mean, our subconscious is programmed from day dot, you know, and a lot of our subconscious is programmed up until the age of seven. And then after that, it's our job to reprogram that if we're even aware of those things. You know, are we aware of like we're, we're taking on the belief systems of our parents, the behaviors of our parents and our peers. And, you know, there are all sorts of different things that we we start to take on as true. And it's incredibly important to be the gatekeeper of your mind because you might have experienced exactly the same thing as somebody else, but it sits in you very differently to what it does the other person because you've assigned a different meaning to it. Like, what have you made that experience mean? Liz can. Welcome. Uh, hello, thank you. <laughs> it was so funny because earlier when I was kind of thinking about how to introduce you, I was sort of saying Liz can, Elizabeth can, and then I was thinking, and it was going round and round in my head, and I'm we're friends so I can say this, but do you watch Friends, the actual TV show? I have done in the past, yeah. <laughs> when Phoebe's like, Ross can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when she's trying to get, when they're trying to get like, tickets to something or whatever but it's so funny because I was just that has literally been going round and round in my head all morning now but in all seriousness like that is that is you like Liz can like the actual it's in it's in your it's in your name like the attitude that you have towards life that can do attitude like however ironic it is but when when did that kind of start for you and and how did you get that attitude towards life from well ironically age? people did used to say if anyone can Liz can <laughs> I knew that something like that yeah. was gonna yeah yeah um, do you know what it's it's hard to think back like when did I first get that it's almost like I think I just got that from my parents through the years I was just so involved in so many different activities and everything I did seemed to turn into a competition like my mum used to say you can't just do a sport for fun like I always seemed to want to compete in it and and try and do the best that I could do in it so I think from a very young age I was so driven to do the best that I could and my best friend from like when I was three years old we used to do all of our activities together and sometimes one of us was a little bit better than the other and then in a different area the other one was better and we both had this belief if you can do it I can do it because we just thought we've well you're the same as me, we're the same, so we're both just as capable as each other. So I think we had that healthy competition with each other. It was healthy. Um, and, yeah, I think it just started from there. God, that's so so good from such a young age that you had that kind of mentality already. And like you said, it's always to do with the people that you surround yourself with, I think, as well. But, yeah, so I guess we can talk a little bit about badminton just to start with because, obviously, that's, you know, you were really successful, number one um, England in England. So um, that kind of sport, I guess, well, I've actually watched a few videos of you play and oh it's dear. just so <laughs> powerful. I think that how you play is how I think I look when I play, <laughs> which is just crazy. But so um, how, did you, how did you find yourself within the, the actual sport like competitive arena um you know there's kind of that masculine feminine energy that's always in there um so how did you navigate that and um how how do you kind of quantify success then to to now now that you're retired from it it's interesting you bring up the masculine feminine energy like as a female athlete in such a masculine kind of world like that competitive sport element and you're lifting heavy weights and thrashing around doing all this aggressive training sometimes but when you manage to balance out the karma side of what brings success that inner stability and inner calmness I, that's when when I figured that out that was when my best levels of success came out the whole keep pushing harder keep trying harder go 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 yeah that's all necessary as well and it's not about demonizing that side of things but it was certainly when you integrate the two together and find what works for you to integrate the two together, that is when you're going to bring out your optimum levels. And interesting, well, what did I think of success then as success? Well, success back then was all about me winning. 
you know, which is very different now. Like I don't see what I'm doing as competition, you know, when I'm working with clients or it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Like it's more about um, just constant improvement, but also just like being okay with not being at my best all the time. That wasn't okay with me when I was an athlete. Maybe it should have been, but it wasn't at the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas where my head is at now, it's not about always trying to be at your best. It's not about always trying to win it's there's there's a lot more to life than that you know and it's it's maybe about having more balance in life and more time to relax and not always pushing harder and being a little kinder to yourself and a little bit easier yeah so going a bit more into that because you you know now that you're doing this coaching and you're working with people you kind of call it a high performer so when like someone like me would might think that um, oh, that, that's just making me feel like I need to work more, I need to do more, I need to perform. And that could make, you know, could could give you anxiety or this or that. But what would you say then is a real high performer? Like, what? let's break it down. Mm. Yeah, it's a good question because I do often refer to like high performers, peak performance, optimal performance. But that isn't necessarily about winning. Um, and it's not, I'm not necessarily referring to an athlete, you know, being out there on the field. It's about... The everyday person, each and every one of us, living life in the optimal state that we can. So where we think in a positive manner. Not, I don't mean like kind of um, always positive, positive, but, you know, we've got our mindset in the right place. We're taking care of our health, our well-being, our self-care. Um, so, you know, taking care of our emotional health, mental health, all of those different elements so that when you go out into the world and do the things that you actually want to do, and that might be career driven, that you might be an athlete, you might be a stay at home mum. It really doesn't matter what the field is or what that you're wanting to um, achieve something in. It's about being in your optimal state to do it so that you can make the most out of your own life you can enjoy your life you can have a more fulfilling life because you are you're maximizing the potential that you've got yeah because you you write something really nice which I wrote down because I want to read it because you know when you read something and you have to kind of read it again just to like let it sink in so you wrote you either purposefully create your life by utilizing your higher mind or you create a default life by reacting to that which surrounds you. So you have to read that. Well, for me, I had to read it like a few times for like for it to sink in. But can you like explain a bit more about that kind of quote? Yeah, I think, look, if we don't create our life with purpose and do that ourselves, we're going to, by default, kind of get bumped around in life, reacting to the things that are presented to us and what other people want from us and are pushing for us to do. And if we're not taking care of our own mindset, if you're not setting goals, if you're not considering what you want out of life, if you're not um, optimising, um, you know, how to make the most out of yourself, taking care of yourself thinking what do I actually want and how am I going to go about achieving it then you just end up reacting to what's around you and then you kind of end up looking back at your life you know 10 20 30 years down the line and think oh I didn't really do the things that I wanted to do or I didn't really know what I wanted to do because I didn't take the time I didn't pause and consider what I really wanted so I think you're you know I, I look at the higher mind as sitting there and you know going with your intuition and just what if if I could have whatever I want what would that be you know and allow yourself to dream big so is there an element of kind of surrender in in that then I guess did you feel that when you were competing back in the day um and then was it like a gradual thing where you just thought I'm going to kind of surrender to my higher mind and just let things pan out as they should without kind of working or striving to do something. Yeah, I think there's a fine balance with this. There's <laughs> definitely an element of surrender. And that was that was hard for me because by nature I'd like to push push and drive and let's keep going. But you it's almost like when people say what got you here won't get you there. All the hard work and the hustle and grind, that will get you somewhere. 
but you need to also just surrender, like you say. You need to be able to let go and relax and flow with things. I think it's that balance of setting your goals and knowing what you want, but also knowing that life's going to bring other opportunities your way. It might be that you think you want to achieve one thing and one sort of goal, but that sets you on the path to a t- totally different route. And it's surrendering to that process and thinking, well, actually, I thought I wanted that, but life's brought something different to me. And by pursuing that original goal, I've now it's now allowed me to go on a totally different path. Do you have any examples of that? Because I definitely do, because I think... It's, it is like you said, you, you just, you have an idea, a set idea in your mind. And there is, there is like um, kind of merit in that, I guess, in visioning something for yourself. But I guess there's also that thing where you just think, okay, um, I want, I want to be, I want to feel happy. I want to feel peaceful, joy. And maybe I don't know what that is yet, but I'm just going to kind of surrender. And then, yeah, somehow life does take you. So do you think that that kind of happened for you like really early on or a bit later that you kind of just let go I would say it was more later um well to be honest with you I probably the prime original example is I started badminton yeah for fun I never in a million years considered that I would have a career in the sport that wasn't a thing in my mind and then by playing these competitions and just playing more and more and, you know, I think my mum taking the initiative to bring me from Jersey to England to play, eventually that turned into a career, but that wasn't the original goal. You know, I, my original goal was I was going to go to university. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what career path that was going to go down, but I was going to go to university, but no, that didn't happen. I ended up on a completely different route. I had... A spot at university I'd gone through all the process for it and then last minute there was a change and I ended up living in Denmark um, and pursuing my sports career so that was a certainly I guess the early example of that happening yeah and then I think when I retired from my sport there was a, certainly a process of surrender to understand what it is that I wanted to do next Um, And I kind of blew with the wind a little bit for a while and just went to different events and things to try to understand what that might be. So it was certainly a process of surrender. Because I guess you, when you retire for something that you've done for so long, there's that kind of loss of identity in some way, because your ego always wants to hold on to something, doesn't it? Like for me in my, my job or um, as a, like an athlete, you think, oh, what am I now? What do I do now? So I guess, yeah, you had to navigate that after and then found your calling in in another in a sort of a, a second phase of your life by helping other people achieve kind of um, to be a high performer. Yeah, there def- definitely is a process of that whole identity shift. And yeah. I do remember re- constantly referring, oh, yeah, I used to be an athlete. Used to be, and then one day I'm like... Okay, let's let that one go now. <laughs> Sometimes it features because it's relevant to what I might be talking about, but not just bringing it up for the sake of bringing it up, you know. But you shift into, like you say, the next phase of life and what that brings. Um, and, yeah, so it, it's, it's certainly an interesting process and that, that kind of concept features is very heavily featured for athletes when they come out of their career. Usually if you've been a professional athlete, you've done the sport from when you were a child. So it's a very emotional career. It's so deep-rooted because it used to be the love, the thing that you loved from a young age, which eventually turned into a career. And then you've got to let it all go and move into something very different which felt frustrating that you've crafted this high ability in something and then you move on, you know. But it's it's also so much to gain from it. Well, yeah, you invest so much time into something and then you build your skill set and then, yeah, there's a time where you have to let it go, which I imagine is quite difficult. Because I actually used to, um, I used to compete, I used to do trampolining, which is very, when, when I say it, it's so random, but I used to actually <laughs> um, compete and... Um, I would always feel um, n- hugely nervous before competitions, actually. Um, and so how did you navigate nerves? Because that's still something that, I mean, it's natural for everyone to feel nervous most of the time when they have to perform. But how did you navigate that and, and how do you navigate that now? 
I definitely ex- um, experienced nerves when I was performing in ba- in all of my sports from when I was a child and I couldn't, I didn't understand what that was when I was a child. Um, I tried many different tactics to try to navigate that at the time and it depended on the day that what would work. Sometimes I would have to remove myself from people and not be around people. Other times I was listening to a certain kind of music. Sometimes I needed to talk to people. Um, but something that was very important as well was meditation and visualisation and also using the breath work as well. And those would then help to get my body and my mind into a very calm and focused state or as close to a calm and focused state as I could. And those are things that I use now as well, very much with the breath work, because I think to consistently help to calm your nervous system and have a, you know, soothe that nervous system. We're constantly aggravating the nervous system throughout life with different stresses that we're sensitive to. So the more that we can work with the nervous system to keep it balanced and have the baseline BS karma level so we're not heightened all the time, then we're able to manage and cope with stress when we're confronted with it. And it doesn't feel like such a big thing. I mean, there's so much I've learned now since being an athlete. There was a lot that I experienced very in a very physical level when I was an athlete. And there was a lot I learned then. But the journey never stopped with that learning. And so, yeah, I think it, those kind of same tools, they apply no it's matter what you're life, doing. isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah, the nervous system is something I definitely want to delve in a bit more with you. Um, because it, it's for me it's fast it's just fascinating yeah. and it's not something that we talk about enough I don't think because I just think that people we think things we're, we're logical but we don't realize that we hold a lot in our bodies we don't tune into our body well I definitely don't enough anyway but also we have the nervous system and we have things that are kind of embedded into us from when we were since we, we were born basically which is insane so Can we talk a bit more about the nervous system in general, but then also a couple of the tools that you just mentioned that might be able to not necessarily change it, but just regulate it and make us understand it better? Yeah, sure. I mean, if we think about, like you were saying, we hold onto things from a very young age and we won't remember half of these things. And like they say, the body knows the score, the body keeps the score. The the you can't lie with the body you know the body's holding on to different things and we we have tension in the body or we feel certain emotions and we don't understand why and often we've not processed emotions properly and we've not dealt with emotions properly and then they just rear up at inappropriate times you know yep Um, yeah (laughs) (laughs) I think we've all experienced that you know throughout life and when it comes to the nervous system if we are consistently stressed out and we don't manage that stress or we don't have a way of dissipating that stress, then it's like we hold on to it and the nervous system is just, it becomes heightened. And you notice if some people have a tendency to be anxious and then, but you've got the, another person who has a tendency to just be chilled and calm and whatever, one of the reasons could be that the person is often anxious. They, they don't allow that. They don't allow a reset of the nervous system. They don't give time out for that to come back. So if you think you go from one thing to the next to the next throughout the day, um, that stresses you, that stresses you. That's, and it might be that there might be an argument with somebody there, but you might consume food somewhere else that stresses you. It might be traffic. It might, do you know what I mean? There could be a number of different things that they might not even be registered as stress to you because we're so used to them. A tool that I really like to use now is using breath work to regulate the heart rhythm. So there's been a lot of studies done with the HeartMath Institute. It's something that I've studied a lot. And when you when you use breath work, and there's a particular technique that you can do with that, it's very simple. You what you do is you create a more regulated heart rhythm in the body. Now, when the heart rhythm becomes coherent, that's what we call coherent when you've got like that nice, smooth, regulated pattern, the brain comes into sync with the heart rhythm. 
So we usually think that the brain sends more signals to the body than the heart does, but it's actually the other way around. The heart is sending out a lot more signals and it's got a very powerful field to it. So if we're regulating our heart rhythm, making that coherent, then in turn the brain becomes coherent. And by the nature of that, when we become coherent there, we're actually quietening down the emotional center and we're lighting up, so to speak, the prefrontal cortex of the brain, our thinking center where we can reason with things. So when you're stressed and you react in a, you know, just more in an erratic sort of manner, and then later on you think, oh, why did I do that? It's because you've you're incoherent, you're erratic, and then your your emotional center is much more alive and awake at that point in time. That thinking part of the brain has quietened down. And so it's almost like you've bypassed the thinking center and gone straight to the emotions. So by taking time out to just breathe slightly slower and slightly deeper than you normally would, and just focus your mind on as though the breath is coming in and out of your heart center, If you spend anywhere from five to 20 minutes at a time doing that and you make that a regular practice, you're actually training your whole system to become more coherent. What I love about that is that brings you into that flow state. Athletes talk a lot about getting into the flow state, but the flow state is relevant whether an athlete or not. You're living life in alignment. You're living life in a coherent state. And therefore, I think we're actually much more in a state of flow and surrender when we're doing that. I I forget to breathe. Yeah. (laughs) I actually forget to breathe. So like when you do, it just, yeah, you can already feel that your body's relaxing, the relief, the kind of clarity in your brain. I mean, I have done some of that um, heart kind of um, regulating that you that you do with a lot of your clients. And yeah, it makes a huge difference. And you have that tool where you can kind of check um, if you're coherent or not as well, which I think is really interesting. So what would you marry up with that then? What other things would you do? Because it's interesting when you say that you you really you're interested in bridging the gap between kind of science and spirituality yeah. so i guess what do you marry up with that to have like a holistic approach yeah there's different pieces of the puzzle that i like to use i think when we're looking at coherence overall i mean yeah we've got like the the practical structural things to help us achieve our goals you know for example goal setting being productive all those kind of actual Um, doing things in life and then we've got what I like to call the inner work where we're doing the the emotional regulation the heart coherence I like to use visualization that's a very very um, common tool used by athletes because the body doesn't know the difference the body and mind doesn't know the difference between what you've actually done in real life compared to what you've imagined loads of studies have been done on this and the body is reacting as though that experience is real. For better or worse, is it reacting as though we're actually living that out? So if we can use that to our advantage and our power by thinking of the thing that you want to experience and coming as close into alignment with that experience as you possibly can in your own mind to the level where you are feeling what you would be feeling if you're experiencing that. So it's not just the thinking process, you're bringing the emotions into that. Um, And then, uh, you know, what would you be seeing? What would you be smelling? What would you be hearing? Make it as alive as possible so that you can attune your, your thoughts with your emotions and then attuning that with action your action so it's like body mind and soul all in one yeah it's that I really believe in that that's so powerful and when you yeah it's I guess it's become a bit cliche but it's the kind of the manifesting kind of thing and I think that yeah definitely um the the recipe for that is just to have that feeling that you've already got something yeah. or what you've got what you wanted and that's almost like the the catalyst for for the change and the shift in you to yeah. then to then manifest it and get it yeah um, and I think that's so powerful so also you say um kind of just going back a little bit there was a moment in time where you just thought there was actually a quite a specific moment where you just thought I'm just going to live with no regrets and I'm going to go for it and I'm going to kind of 
um, changed my lifestyle in this way. What what was that moment for you? Yes, I distinctly remember that. I was living in Denmark at the time. Yeah. I was in my early 20s. And I thought, whatever I do or don't achieve in my career, and whenever the point, the end point comes, who knows when that could be. It could be tomorrow with an injury or it could be 10, 15 years down the line. Um, I wanted to be able to look back and be at peace with whatever I achieved, knowing that I did the best that I could. doesn't mean you're always going to be perfect and you're going to have off days and, you know, you're only human at the end of the day. But what it did do was it, it shaped all of my choices. So if there was something, a, a decision I was making about whether that was going to pull me off track and affect my performance and maybe there was a time and a place for that where I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to let my hair down and do whatever. Then that's fine, but I'm making a conscious choice with that. And I, so I wanted to make sure that, my choices were aligned with the goal that I said that I wanted to have. And I think when we can bring together the thing that you're envisioning together with um, your mind and your emotions and your choices and bring that all into alignment, that's when you you know you're doing the best that you possibly can. It might be somebody who's doing it a little bit better or somebody who's not doing it as well as you, but you're on your own journey. And so I think that was more what it was about for me. It was about having no regrets, knowing I did the best that I could at each point in time. And so I feel as though, you know, I didn't achieve everything I wanted to achieve, but I can be at peace to know that I gave it my all. So... What does a down day look like for Liz? Because I know I know you, we've known each other for a while and you are really, um, like, you're strong, you're optimistic, but I guess what does a kind of more vulnerable down day look like for you? A down day for me would be if I'm... Sometimes I can find it overwhelming. There are so many things that I want to do, so many things that I... to do I'm almost doing nothing because there's so much to do and I've got to bring myself back to the drawing board right okay let's take a baby step what can I do today and maybe if it's a down day there are days where I, I don't do that you know it's I also have the support from coaches to help me just like I support clients in that kind of way um, if I haven't done my the, the practices that I'm talking about then I could get myself wound up and I'm not as calm as I'd like to be and I'm not in that flow state that I'd like to be in. And then everything feels disjointed and kind of clunky. So then it's about bringing myself back to those practices of what I know work for me. You know, sometimes there could be a longer period of time that I'm not doing the things that I'd ideally like to be doing. So then I have to pull myself back in and think, right, okay, let's ha- let's regroup Let's reset. What are we? Where are we going? What direction are we going in? Yeah, I can relate because I feel that I'm. I can be quite ultra independent sometimes, yeah. and you're kind of you're thinking that you're on your own. You're, oh, I've got to do this, and you've just got to get through it, and you're on your own. But you should pull from from community as well, definitely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can I can definitely relate to that. Um, so in terms of your kind of um, well, some of the lessons that you, I guess teach or cover procrastination is one that I know that you've you've spoke we just spoke about now but you speak about so um I think it would help I mean definitely helps people like me who sometimes I can be really really productive and then some days I will just procrastinate and it's something I've had to work on really um had to be really conscious about and work on so for listeners that might be struggling with that what um kind of tips do you have now Um, just like quick tips for them on that yeah I think first of all it's kind of getting to the bottom of why you're procrastinating and sometimes that can be a surface level thing where you simply just don't have the structures in place in order to make it a little bit easier for yourself but other times it can be a deeper rooted reason maybe you're avoiding something that you're afraid of doing for example and so that's the first step is to identify is there something deeper going on or am I just haven't got the structures in place if it's a more of a surface level thing then you can set things in place that um 
you reduce the resistance of you doing that thing. So let's say it's about going to the gym. So by reducing the resistance of it, maybe you've got your gym bag ready the night before, you've got your clothes laid out, you've got your shower stuff ready, all those kind of things. So all you've got to do is get up, put your clothes on and get to the gym. That would be reducing the resistance for it. Uh, If it's that you're maybe trying to eat less sugary foods or whatever that might be, then you don't keep it in the house. So you increase the resistance for you to do that thing, which means that you have to get in the car, go down to the shop when you fancy having that thing. So those could be like a more surface level thing to deal with. And then if it is that you're maybe avoiding something because of the fear of it, um, then probably getting to the root of why you're afraid of it, um, what's the worst that could happen, you know, what is, maybe sometimes there are things that you might want to achieve a certain goal, but actually by achieving that goal, it brings other complications to your life, you know, so it's maybe laying all those things out on the table of why you're avoiding what you're avoiding and the thinking, okay, well, take them one at a time. What will I do if I do experience that thing that I perceive as negative? And so by the time you you could almost have a little action plan in place for yourself just in case you encounter those things. And you might not even encounter those things, but if you do, you know how you're going to cope with it. Because when we set goals, we can make it all rosy. We can you look at it through rose-tinted glasses, mm-hmm. but actually every goal really is neutral because everything has benefits and drawbacks to it. And so I think by having a balanced perspective on what our goals are and you know, how we're going to achieve, how we're going to um, overcome any challenges that we might face. I think that helps us to be a little calmer about it and, and not so resistant to taking the action in the end. Yeah, I think, and it all boils down to again, in the end, our makeup and how we, how we are, you know, the nervous system again, and, and subconscious too. I mean, what, um, in your kind of, um, what you've been learning and your studies do you is there anything on the subconscious that you have learned about because that again is super interesting to me and I think that we I mean I think I've read or I've listened somewhere that we we basically use like most it's like 90 percent or something is our sub coming from our subconscious which is crazy so can you tell us a little bit more about that if you've learned about that too yeah definitely I mean you're you're absolutely right the majority of how we act in life is subconscious and gosh I mean our subconscious is programmed from day dot you know and a lot of our subconscious is programmed up until the age of seven and then after that it's our job to reprogram that if we're even aware of those things you know are we aware of like we're we're taking on the belief systems of our parents the behaviors of our parents and our peers and you know there are all sorts of different things that we we start to take on as true and it's incredibly important to be the gatekeeper of your mind because you might have experienced exactly the same thing as somebody else but it sits in you very differently to what it does the other person because you've assigned a different meaning to it like what have you made that experience mean you know I like I look at it as we kind of look at life through different colored glasses your glasses might be pink my glasses might be yellow and that's that's according to our different experiences that we've had in life and therefore our subconscious programming so I think just I mean a a quick and easy way I say easy it's not necessarily (laughs) easy (laughs) but if if something triggers you in some kind of way or upsets you in some kind of way or somebody says something to you that you dislike you have a choice you get to decide whether you take that on as true or not and if you do take it on as true that's likely to become something that sits in your subconscious and becomes a belief that you live by so we need to be the gatekeeper of the mind so that we're not just flippantly taking on anything around us as true question things question things all the time even just when you beliefs that you already have question where that came from like why do I even believe that like is it actually true you know ask yourself that question is it true is it true ask it five times because usually first time around we're like yes it is (laughs) second time around well yeah third time around well I mean 
I don't know. And then you you kind of loosen your grip on the belief that you have. So, God, yeah. yeah, well, seven years of programming, I mean, especially when you're a child as well and you're, you're more susceptible to, to things and you are just taking things in constantly, that's, you know, that's quite hard to overcome. And I, I guess we spend most of our adult life not necessarily reprogramming ourselves, but we, we should just, yeah, like you said, question, be curious and question and say, is that coming from there or am I actually yeah. feeling and, and believing this way um I guess that that also ties in with what you've just said a minute ago about families and um family systems and that's something that I've been really interested in as well is that something you do in your work um in terms of deep diving with your clients or even it'd be great to kind of go into your mind a bit about your family system and mm-hmm. um, but is that something that you've um you've ever explored yeah, I mean, look, it's all part um, part and parcel of working with an individual. And in order for us to maximise our potential and bring out the best in ourselves, sometimes we need to understand why we're at where we're at. And it's not so much therapy that I do where I'm really digging into the past, but the part, you can't get away from the, the past is connected to the present and therefore the future. So... Yes, we're all we've all had such varied experiences throughout life and it's important for us to know what beliefs we're holding on to. And is it important to know necessarily why we hold on to a belief? Maybe, maybe not, because the fact of the matter is you do and that's that. So how are you going to move forwards? You know? So I think sometimes we can spend a lot of time digging into why, but actually more it's about how are we going to move forwards. But on that, though, I just want to dig a little bit because I obviously you've you know, you have this mindset and a lot of that a lot of people, um, I guess, would admire. And, and I definitely do. So can you tell us a bit about like young Liz, but also your family system and things that maybe you experienced that you gave you the kind of enabled you to become this way? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I had a, a great family upbringing um, it was a very interesting dynamics okay. with my mum and my dad mm-hmm. because if I just if I relate that to me as a a young child doing my sport and maybe through my young teens, my mum was the ultra optimist and my dad was the realist. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good balance. Slash now. pessimist at times. <laughs> and so my mum would be very much, oh, you're nearly there. You know, when I'm trying to like knock on the heels of the, the people that were winning and I want to be the one that was winning. And my dad might be like, oh, I don't know. You've got a hell of a long way to go yet. And he was always right. He actually, in you at least. <laughs> he would ground me, yeah. And so it was, I think it always balanced me out somewhere in the middle. I would say I am someone who is always hopeful, but at the same time, I can also get very nervous. And so I have to manage. It's an interesting dynamics between the two of those. My older brother, he's four and a half years older than me, and he was very successful in badminton first. And he, he'd stopped playing a lot earlier. But I think me seeing him winning trophy after trophy after trophy, and he was, his trophies were literally filling up the cabinet in the dining room. <laughs> and the conversation was often geared around his badminton. And I found it irritating because I was like, well, what about my badminton? Like, where, you know, when am I going to win a trophy? And I actually wonder if it's that that subconsciously mm-hmm. became the driving force for me to want to win definitely I mean maybe because I've been asked often like why badminton why do you want why and I don't really know the answer it was just the sport I absolutely loved more than any of the other sports that I did so that's me probably looking back and considering that that could be a reason why I was so driven and you loved it more than him I think I remember you saying but then he was just like he was he wasn't as like interested in it as you but he was kind of just winning things here there and everywhere and that always happens isn't it when you're just not that you don't you're not that bothered yeah he definitely was he was definitely better at the sport than me I mean you know I'm not afraid to admit that I think I had more drive than him yeah and that's not just in badminton I think maybe just like a lot of 
a lot of things in life, even in school and things like that. I was more driven than he was. He's also very driven outside of that, maybe in things he's more interested in. But but then it just yeah. goes to show that it's not always the... I mean, obviously, talent and skill comes into it, but it is, like, you've just proven it then. It just goes to show it's your drive, it's your your mentality towards things. Um, and, yeah, it's not always about the talent. No, definitely not. If anyone's listening and they think, oh, but I'm not as good as others at this naturally, that doesn't necessarily matter. It It might play a part in it to a degree, but it doesn't mean you can't succeed. You just have to be prepared to work at it. It's as simple as that. You have to be prepared to work at it. You can't escape the hard work, but it just if it's worth it to you, then you will be prepared to do that. Yeah, and I think that a lot of the time in society, I've noticed that people think hard work means struggle, means striving, but it means, like you've said, just being focused and understanding your body, understanding your mind, understanding what you want to achieve and then just going for it. But obviously you have to take action to do that. But there are loads of tools, I guess, that people can use, um, you know, mentally to to do that without without the struggle yeah I mean look if I look back at my sports career there was struggle but my overall impression of it was that it was great and it was because it was all worth it to me so the times where I maybe had to sacrifice all the you know going out clubbing and things Mm -hmm. like that at that time it was worth it to me because I wanted what I wanted and so I was prepared to do that. And anything where, look, the higher up you go and the higher the thing that you want to achieve, there are going to be things that you're going to face and you're going to come up against. It's not going to be necessarily smooth sailing. It might be. I'm open to everything being a possibility. And I'm open to it not being a complete and utter struggle, you know, like that's always a possibility. It doesn't have to be tussle, tussle. I think everyone's going to go through different journeys. And it's interesting when you look at the modality of NLP, neuro linguistic programming, and something that that's all about us rewiring our brain and, yeah. you know, all those things. And a big part of that is modeling others. And look, I think we're all very complicated so it's maybe not quite as simple as that but when you model somebody you're looking at what exactly are they doing to achieve what they achieve Mm. from the day-to-day actions to the way they think the way they carry themselves you know and we're all different people so there's maybe going to be a little bit of complexity to that but there's a lot that we can learn from others and if there is somebody that seems to have a smoother path to something a lot smoother path than you maybe there's something you can learn in that from them yeah and I guess it's just making sure that you're not comparing but that word more modeling and just seeing like what we're doing here with you I guess that's why you know um kind of delving into what your experiences and how you think of things again it's going to help a lot of people kind of model that so when they when people do come to you um, with some you know they might have it might be for various reasons mm-hmm. but to kind of improve their lifestyle improve their mental health what are the kind of things we I mean we've touched upon a lot of them but what say someone comes to you what's the first thing that you would do and can you give us an overview of of what that kind of session would look like yeah so i'm initially very initially we we have a a chat just almost like a chemistry check to see if we're right to work for each other both ways because, you know, you know not everyone's the right person for you to work with. Um, and then once we've established that that's something we want to go ahead with, it's about getting really clear on what that person wants to get out of the coaching process so that we know come the end of the coaching process where they're at in conjunction with achieving what they've set out to do. And then from there, we're also looking at what, basically where are you now where do you want to be and what's stopping you from being there and then we start to work to bridge the gap between the current the present state and the future goal and it's going to look different for every person because we've all got different reasons for it but I'm you know it's a bit I'm the mind is always a very big part of it 
regulating our emotions is always a very big part of it identifying the different areas that we need to raise up and is it a structural gap there or is there a deeper reason if we need to dive deep into well we we always dive deep to be honest with you I don't really do things on a surface level like I said it's bridging that gap between science and spirituality and really going on a deep deep level in order to accomplish what we want to accomplish Mm -hmm. So that's the level that I like to work on with clients. And the more somebody opens up, the quicker we can get there, basically. And I think the coaching process is about somebody being able to shine a light on what's holding you back. Because if we could do it all on our own, we would have done it by now. Yeah, it's you the know. support. It's someone holding you accountable. And yeah. It's, um, yeah, support's really, like, like I said earlier, with community um, have but we just we don't really we don't pull on that enough yeah. I don't think yeah. these days you know we if we're fortunate enough to have people around us that love us that are willing to support us but also you know professional people as yeah. well I think we should definitely yeah. pull on that and I don't know why we've just seemed to have lost that over the years I know this whole I can do it myself thing it's like it's you can do it to a certain degree yourself but you know, there's only so far you can go. And I think when when you work with a coach, it becomes we, not I, but mm. we. And I know from my experience of having a coach, it's almost like a big sigh of relief. Yeah. Oh, thank goodness I've got somebody to help me. Gives you this. strength. Exactly. Yeah. It gives you strength. And it does hold you just by the nature that you are, you're, there is someone in your corner that you're working with and is kind of helping to keep an eye on where you're at. Mm. That in itself provides accountability. Uh, you know you're not you're far less likely to procrastinate on those things because that's what you're working through those are the things you're you're dealing with yeah so we've touched upon some of the more scientific things like the Mm. heart regulating and coherence but with some of the more spiritual things like meditation do you do that with clients too um and are there any other ones that are a bit more like you said you want to go deep yeah. So what kind of things are you really doing to get deep, kind of more spiritual? Yeah, I mean, meditation is definitely a really key yeah. part of the process as well. And um, I, I like to, well, you know, on a spiritual level, everything has a frequency. And the more coherent and in alignment we can become, the the more we are aligning on a quantum level. And so something I, I like to use as a frequency device as well. So that's very much working on a deep cellular and energetic level. And it is a little tool that will determine where you have energetic imbalances that are blocking you from moving forwards. And then it will recommend and deliver frequencies to your bioenergetic field. And that that will help to move you forwards on a very deep energetic level. And so that's that's a tool that I like to recommend to my clients so that they can use that during and in between sessions with me. But if we think about everything, everything that we do, even to the food we eat, to how we manage our stress, to our sleep, to the people we're around, that all affects us on an energetic level. And so identifying all the different areas that stop us from being in the flow state is something that's really, really important to do. I like to really go deep on what the different elements are that are not in an ideal state. And look, it's not about perfection, (laughs) but it is about cleaning up as much of that stuff as we possibly can so that once we get what I like to call in alignment... It, it almost like clears the channel. So it makes everything flow a lot more easily. You know, we are electromagnetic beings. And if we take care of our electromagnetic field through our emotions, through our thoughts, through our feelings, then and, and through the physical body, and we bring all of those into that coherent aligned state, then energetically, we are aligned and therefore in a position to have much greater success. I just find that from my own experiences, before I understood a lot of this stuff, I found that when I meditated regularly, when I visualised regularly, 
when I was doing the breathing exercises, when I was sleeping well, when I was eating well, when I just had good hygiene in all of those areas, I just seemed to draw the successes to me and experience these successes. And I couldn't understand the relationship of, well, what's the thing that I'm eating and the food and the sleep, what's that really got to do with why I'm experiencing a particular success in a certain area? And now I think it's because I'm in energetic alignment with these things to happen. And so that's more on a spiritual quantum level that I'm now in alignment. So it that drove me to digging deeper on, okay, what are these areas that are bringing me more into alignment or blocking me from being in alignment? And so, therefore, in this coherent state that we spoke about. Yeah, it's always the small things, isn't yeah. it, that we just don't think matter that much, yeah. that actually build up and they do. But And, and I know that life gets in the way yeah. and then, you know, you just oh, I'm too busy to do that or to think about that right now. But it is about consistency. But that's what so many people struggle with. I struggle with that a lot. Um, And it's also, I guess, I mean, you're definitely, we're definitely privileged if we can can think about that and do that kind of stuff. There are a lot of people out there that, that I guess, don't have that privilege. But it's not just about that. It is, you can start small. So I guess everyone can, you know, do that somehow but how do you recommend that people people who have those lives that are just very stressful busy what are the small I mean apart from some of the things you said in terms of thinking about what you eat and sleep Mm -hmm. what are some of the other patterns that they can really be conscious of I would say the very first thing for people to do when they're in that situation is just give yourself little uh, blocks of time to just stop and breathe Even if that is like, yeah, it's as simple as that. Even if that is doing two minutes or five minutes, because that's all the time that you've got. And like, I do realise people have got incredibly busy lives, which is why it's not always realistic to spend, oh, I'm going to go and meditate for an hour or even half an hour. Sometimes that might seem too much. But if you just get in the car after work, just take five minutes and just breathe. Um, And very baby steps just what is one thing that you can improve on and just make a slight little change in one area and don't be too hard on yourself definitely don't go down the line of all or nothing I've been there (laughs) I'm either on it or I'm not on it and then you if you're not on it then you know it's like oh it's a downward spiral exactly you almost go, go to town with not being you know on point so identifying one thing that you can make a little shift in and just that in itself gives you an internal shift because you feel a little bit better for having changed that one thing and that is an energetic shift in you and you've done something for yourself that is one step closer to being in alignment yeah yeah the energy thing is really interesting I mean I've believed that for many years um I mean I read books but yeah. it, you feel it and you do when you go into a room like again another thing that we don't really take much notice of we're very logical we just think well not everyone's logical but <laughs> yeah we're very, we very we think a lot yeah. I mean it's like incessant thinking really if we really think about it yeah. um but when you walk into a room you you can actually feel the energy in that room or you can feel the energy. You might think, oh, no, I'm not, this isn't for me and you might need to... I mean, I've had instances where I've had to leave leave a room because I just felt felt it too strong and this is just, yeah, it's, it's not good. Um, and then vice versa. Yeah. So um, have you felt have you felt oh, anything like absolutely. that before? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely felt that. I mean, I've had it where I've walked past somebody yeah. in the street and I'm like, oh, I don't know what... <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. You know when you maybe you come across somebody and you can't quite figure out why, but they're just not for you. But outwardly, you can't, you know, you can't put your finger on yeah. what that is. It doesn't necessarily mean there's something bad about that person, but they're just a, a mismatch in your energy. Um, But even just if you walk into a room, you could present something happy and fun, but maybe energetically you're really off and then somebody you know says, are you all right? You know, and you're like, oh, how did you know? You know, because your energy doesn't lie. We're all connected, aren't we? Yeah. 
Um, and gosh, that could be another podcast in itself. Yeah, exactly, I'm so yeah. interested <laughs> in all of that. Um, definitely. But so I guess what would be your, um, you know, you talk a lot about the potential within people and you, you work with people on that. So what's your kind of last message, I guess, to the listeners? Um, I would say you are far more capable than you could even realise at this stage. And it's about if you just allow yourself to dream big and then just see what could come out of you. Just be prepared to commit to the journey and just be prepared to be honest with yourself and take those baby steps or not, or giant steps if that's what you want to do. But just know that you are far more capable than you could possibly think right now. Yeah, definitely. I think that's so true and such an important message and I think a lot of people are going to take a lot of these like nuggets of information you've just given um, and they'll it'll really help them and I will you know make sure that they know where to find you if they need you as well and um, but we've kind of reached a point in the podcast now where I do a little fun um, pink mondo truth or dare oh, it's a little new oh. thing <laughs> so don't be scared it'll be fun. so do you pick truth or dare oh I pick truth I thought you'd pick yeah. truth um, what's your biggest pet peeve? Oh, gosh. That's an one. interesting one. <laughs> when people ask me this, I'm like, there are so many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which one to pick? That's going to sound like a really trivial, silly thing. After, a, what, after what we've just after spoken about. After everything we've spoken about, it's <laughs> if I'm on the phone to someone and they're slurping with their drink. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. And um, yeah, hopefully we can talk more about energy and all yeah, that absolutely. other stuff again Thank soon. You for having me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liz.